One way to represent numbers and data is by using an interval notation. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of look at all the different ways we can use that notation and then see how it applies. You've probably seen in the past some inequality notation where you wrote less than or equal to, greater than or equal to. We would take that and we would call that a solid dot if we were looking at a number line. Or maybe you saw less than or greater than. Again, you would take that and maybe call it an open circle if you were looking at a, a range of numbers on a number line. Where our interval notation comes into play is we're going to use some of that information, but we also need some better notation with it. With the closed circle, you may have seen maybe some closed brackets. With the open circle, you may have seen some open brackets. So let's kind of look at the different ways we can set up these notations in a specific example. It says using the correct notation, express all real numbers greater than or equal to negative two and less than one. So first let's tackle this first part. We want all real numbers greater than or equal to negative two. So we're gonna say all real numbers, let's call that X. And we're gonna show this as an inequality, set builder notation, and then this interval. The first thing we're going to do with the inequality is we're going to call it x. That's the set of all real numbers. We don't really know what number we're looking at, but we want any number that's greater than, so we're going to put a greater than sign, or equal to negative 2. Then it says and, so we'll say and, less than 1. And so we're going to say x is less than one. Another compact way to write this is we would say negative two. We would put our symbol. You can see that even though this is reversed, the inequality is facing the x where it was in the first one. And then we could put our next inequality in one. And this would be a more compact way to write this. And maybe this is a set of inequality that you've seen. Set Biddle notation is not as common. The way you start to set it up is you start with a curly bracket. You say X, and then you put a straight up and down bar. That means such that. And then you place in the inequality. And then you close it with a curly bracket. Now to show you the interval notation, let me go ahead and add in a number line. So if I'm looking at all the values, we already kind of discussed some notation. Here would be negative 2. Here would be positive 1. We would say, well, we want to include negative 2 because it's equal to that. So we could use a solid dot. You remember this from previous courses. And then we could use an open dot on one, and we would just shade this area in between. Now, depending on where you worked with inequalities at, you may have also done this and used a square bracket to represent negative 2, a parentheses to represent that open circle. That more relates to what you see with interval notation, you could say a square bracket, negative two, comma one, open bracket. So the square bracket means that you're including that value. The, the parentheses means that you're not including the value. You put the smaller number on the left and the larger number on the right. And you can see how compact this notation is compared to the other notations. So when you're working problems, if it asks you to write it in an interval notation, this is the formatting that it's looking for. Let's do another example. It says express all numbers less than negative 5 or greater than or equal to 3 in interval notation. So maybe we want to start with a picture to better understand what's going on with the situation. So here's negative 5 and here's 3. Those are really the only two numbers that are mentioned. We want to express all numbers less than negative 5. So here's the numbers less than negative 5 or greater than 3. So I want these numbers over here. It said equal to, so that means I want to include this value. Now again, if we use the pieces like we were doing before, this one is not equal to, so it's like an open circle. So above that, we would have a parentheses, negative 5, comma, negative infinity. The infinity is how you mark how you're just going off without a boundary, because all my numbers are getting smaller as I go this direction. I would have a squared off bracket because it's colored in at three or it's including it, it's equal to. So I'd put three comma infinity. And again, three is smaller than infinity. So that's why it's on the left. Now the way I can put those two pieces together because I want to represent all the numbers that are less than negative five or greater than, I would say negative infinity to five, negative five. Union with, you put an uppercase U, 
3 to infinity. So this would be the interval notation representing that number line that we, we just used. So this right here is called your union, and that's how you join those pieces together when you have multiple pieces on a number line. Now we have this conversation about intervals because of what we're going to look at next. We want to look at this idea of domain and range. And remember, domain is all possible x values. And then your range is all possible y values. And so what we want to do is we want to find what are all the x's that were used in this graph, what are all the y values that were used in this graph, and then go from there. So let's look at the first graph. You will notice that this is a closed circle. So that means we're probably going to be using brackets. You can see that this is an open circle. So we're probably going to be using parentheses. We're first going to look at the domain of this. So we're going to be looking at x values. So you see that this is my x axis right here. And the farthest on the x values that that goes is a negative 5. And then if you look at the x values on the right hand side, the farthest right it goes is at 3. So I'm putting negative 5 on the left. I'm going to put 3 on the right. Then I see that it's closed at negative 5, so square bracket. It's open at 3, so parentheses. And so this would be the domain of that function. If you look at range, now we're going to be looking at y values. So here's our y axis. So we're going to be looking at these for our reference of numbers. This is the highest it goes on that y axis, and that is at a value of 2. So that means it's going to be the larger number, so on the right. And then the lowest it goes is right here at this y value of 0. So that means that's going to be on the left. At 0, there's no open circle or anything. The curve is just going through that, so that means it's going to be including that. At 2, this one is closed and this one is open. So we do have a value at 2, so we're also going to include it. Now this asked me for write it in inequality and interval notation. So that's your interval notation. So let's look at the inequality. Doesn't matter the order that you wrote those in. So this would be negative 5 is less than or equal to x is less than 3. We're not going to put an equal to because it's the parentheses. And then 0 is less than or equal to y is less than or equal to 2. And we're going to do equal to because they're both square brackets. And also note x for domain, y for range. Let's do another curve. Very similar. It's just kind of a piece of a curve. But we can take the same approach. So first let's look at domain. So again, domain is your x's. So we're looking at how far we're going left and right. The farthest left is this value here at negative 3. The farthest right is this value at 2. So I'm going to say negative 3 comma 2. We have a closed circle at negative 3, so I'm going to put a squared off bracket. We have an open circle at 2, so I'm going to do a parentheses. We could go ahead and continue with the inequality and say negative 3 is less than or equal to x is less than 2. And then we can move to range. Now remember with range, we're looking at y values. So when you start looking at our inequalities for our y values, we need to make sure there's a y there, not an x, so it's a little bit different. And then we'll go, we are looking at this y-axis. So I'm going to see how tall on the y-axis did we go, and we can see that that occurred at 4. How low did it go? We can see that occurred at negative 5. So I would say negative 5 to 4. We do have a closed circle at negative 5, so I'm going to include it. This one is swooping through 4. It doesn't have an open circle or anything, so we're also going to include it. And then if you like, from your inequality, you can set up your interval, negative 5 to 4, and then squared off brackets, because we do have both values there. So these are just two different graphs we can look at domain and range. 
The next graphs we're going to look at are very important. We are going to use these parent functions throughout the course and having a good knowledge of what these parent functions do and their characteristics can really help you in other faucets of this course. So we're just going to kind of go through these and talk about their different characteristics. So the first one is your constant function. This has an equation of f of x equal to c. When you're looking at this function here, um, it has a domain. We've already began the conversation of domain here. It goes negative infinity to infinity. So when you have every single number, we call that all real numbers. So we make a capital R and just put another little stem on it. The range on this function is just at y equal to c. It's going through 2. Every single y value on that graph has a value of 2. Then we go to the next one called the identity function or you know this one as the linear function. It has an equation of f of x equal to x. Looking at this graph here, the domain, you can see it's going all the way left, all the way right. So again, negative infinity to infinity, or we could just say all real numbers. Its range is everything up and down, and so we could say negative infinity to infinity. Now, these are known as parent functions because these are our most basic functions. We're going to work with all these functions throughout the course, and we're going to move them around and shrink them and compress them and do different things to them. But these are the most basic functions um, that those other ones are going to come from. You can see that's why it doesn't have any numbers as we're writing out these basic equations. The absolute value function has a equation of f of x equal to absolute value of x. I always remember it kind of looks like a v for value. Its domain is negative infinity to infinity. Again, that's because as we look left and right, like we just did in the previous example, we're using all those values. You can see it has arrows on the end of it, so it doesn't even end outside this picture. The range for this one actually starts at zero. You can see that's the lowest it goes, and then goes up to infinity. Our next one is our quadratic. This has a basic equation of f of x equal to x squared. Sometimes they call this the squared function. It has a domain of all real numbers, that negative infinity to infinity, and similar to absolute value, 0 to infinity. The cubic function is f of x equal to x cubed. You can see left, right, top, bottom. It's using all those different numbers, and so those are all real numbers. The square root function is f of x equal to square root of x. So we would say, what is this domain? It's going to include 0 and go to infinity. Its range is only in that top right quadrant. And so it is going to be starting at 0 and going to infinity. It's a slow go. This will eventually go get larger real slow. But if we go way out, it'll eventually pick up those terms. The cube root function, this is f of x equal to the cube root of x. Again, it has a domain of all real numbers and a range of all real numbers. The reciprocal function is f of x equal to 1 over x. Now, the fact this is has a fraction and the x is in the denominator means that we can't ever have a 0 there. So when we're looking at domain, x cannot equal 0. If we want to talk about it in an interval notation, we would say negative infinity to 0, union with 0 to positive infinity, just leaving that exact value of 0 out. Dealing with that fraction, the output or the y values that would come out of it for range, the y is never going to be 0. So again, interval notation-wise, it's going to look the same. It's basically all the real numbers except 0. Reciprocal squared is f of x equal to 1 over x squared. So that means domain-wise, you're looking at, again, just taking out 0 because we can't have 0 in the denominator. But the range changes because now that it's squared, everything's going to come out to be positive. So we're going to go 0 to infinity. So we're just dropping that first half of that. So again, I just want to kind of look at these nine different functions so we can start to understand what's going on as we work with all our different domains and ranges and how they manipulate from there. Now, we're not always going to give the luxury of giving a graph, and so that brings us to our next part. We want to look at domain from an equation. And the main thing that you want to look for is 
problem spots. What are problem spots? One, we just saw it in the last part there with those reciprocal functions. That is when your denominator, it can't equal zero because we can't divide by zero. The second part that we can look at is we can't have negative under our square root. Our calculator is not going to work with that. And so we're going to look for these two problem areas as we now look for domain in equations. So it says find the domain of the following function. So I see the equation and I see that this square root right here, that's what's going to cause us some problems. We see in part number two, we can't have a negative underneath there. So since this under part can't be negative, what we need to do is we need to solve for that. So we're going to say, well, x plus 4 can't be negative. So in math terms, it has to be greater than or equal to 0 because 0 is okay. And then we solve that. So I'm going to subtract 4 from both sides. That gives me x is greater than or equal to negative 4. Interval notation-wise, I would say negative 4 to infinity. So I want all the numbers that are bigger than negative 4. And so again, looking at the domains of equations, you're looking for your problem areas. We're not running to graphs. We're looking at the equation and looking at what could occur. And the next one, we can see that we have a fraction. What's our problem with fractions? Not that we just don't always like them, but we can't have the denominator. It cannot equal zero. So we're gonna focus on that. Six minus three X cannot equal zero. So subtract six. Negative three X cannot equal negative six divide by negative 3. So x cannot equal positive 2. Negative 6 over negative 3, I divide that out, that gives me the positive 2. So that means I want all the numbers but 2. So like we saw with the parent functions, I'm going to go negative infinity to 2, union with 2 to positive infinity. So I'm taking all those numbers except for 2. Next one says, find the domain of the following function. Well, a couple of things that we can look at this. First of all, I don't see a square root and I don't see any fractions. So there is no problem spots. Next thing to consider is too, notice that this is a cubic function and we also know there's no issues with that either. So in this case, there's not solving out to do. We didn't see any problem spots, so our domain is gonna be negative infinity to infinity. And this is true for all polynomials. Last one, we're going to put some stuff together. So here's what I see issues with. First of all, we have division by zero. So we know that this cannot equal zero. Second of all, I see that I have a square root. So I'm also going to have to work on that and say, well, this piece under here has to be greater than or equal to zero. So this is going to be kind of a two-part process for me. So I'm going to paste this out. First, I'm going to do my red part. I'm going to say x minus 4 cannot be 0, so that means x cannot be 4. And then I'm going to do the top part of under that root. x minus 3 has to be greater than 0. I'm going to add the 3 over, so x is greater than or equal to 3. Now, the tricky part with this is we got to put this all together. So this means I need to be greater than 3 and not include 4. So if I were on a number line, that would be let's do greater than 3. So here's 3, here's 4. Greater than 3, so I would have a closed circle because it's equal to all the way through 4. And then the red part, it can't include 4, so I would have an open circle there. So interval-wise, we're looking at 3 to 4 union with 4 to infinity. So it does get a little tricky as you're working through your notation, but just take it slow and pick through your pieces. Again, go and attempt the homework using these notes as your guides and then reach out to your instructor if you need additional assistance.